Welcome to the Center for Ethics and Human Values Conversation about Research Ethics panel on the ethics of DIY science and citizen science. This is a monthly conversation that we have um, with external experts on sort of topics that go beyond the regulatory oversight and um, issues that you might come into contact with uh, in IRBs. Um, this program is funded by the Office of Research and it's also supported by the um, OSU Medical Center, Center for Bioethics and the College of Public Health. I am super excited to have um, Anna Wexler and Lisa Rasmussen to be discussing uh, the ethics of DIY science and citizen science. So I'm going to um, read a little bit about this and then we're going to, the way that we're going to be um, doing the panel is Anna is going to be um, presenting first, uh, given her research, and then Lisa is going to pre be presenting um, after that. I have a set of questions that I have sort of developed with Lisa and Anna, and we'll talk through those. And as always, we welcome any questions that you have from the audience. So you can see at the bottom, there's a Q&A little icon. Please feel free throughout the whole session to ask questions and we're going to reserve the last 10 to 15 minutes to um, talk about those questions. Um, so while the effort to develop a COVID-19 vaccine is happening at unprecedented speed, um, it's not happening fast enough for some. Um, motivated by the idea that exceptional times demand exceptional actions, there is a growing movement among professional and quote unquote, citizen scientists to participate in DIY vaccine trials. Are those sorts of experiments a way to democratize science or are they just imposing unnecessary harm to participants and the general population? Do these trials even constitute human subjects research? And if so, can they be ethically justified? Um, we have some uh, really excellent experts uh, to talk about this today. So um, Anna Wexler is the Assistant Professor of Medical Ethics and Health Policy at University of Pennsylvania. And she is um, uh, joined with Lisa Rasmussen, who's a professor in the Department of Philosophy at University of North Carolina, Sh Charlotte. And they are co-PIs on a project that is looking at DIY science. Um, and I'm sure they'll talk more about that. So to no further ado, um, and I can take the floor. Great. Um, so I'm going to get my uh, slides here. So I'm going to do share screen. Okay. Can people see these slides? Not yet. All right. Let's try that again. Thumbs up. Okay, great. So it's always fun to um, talk about DIY science and I'm particularly excited um, for the conversation today because um, I haven't yet had a chance to talk about um, the DIY COVID vaccine. Um, and so what I thought I would do today, well, first I should just say, so I'm, I'm coming to this, I'm, I'm, I'm in medical ethics. Uh, my training is in the social sciences um, and my work studies, um, or a lot of my work studies do it yourself medical movements. Um, and I do that basically using sociological methods. So I'm really interested in understanding the people um, and their practices. And I use that to inform thinking about ethical uh, and legal issues. So that's where I'm coming from to this uh, space. And so what I wanted to do today was just set the scene for you in terms of um, the background of do-it-yourself science and medicine. So um, DIY COVID vaccine uh, efforts did not emerge right out of thin air. So they're really coming against this background of, of other movements that have been ongoing um, throughout the last few decades. So uh, I'm gonna talk a bit about that and then talk about the recent um, DIY COVID um, vaccine efforts. Uh, but before I do that, I wanted to just take a moment to reflect on the term DIY, because um, we often use it, but we often don't actually reflect deeply on, on what it means. So. Uh, most people who are outside, maybe science and medicine, when you, when you say DIY, the first thing that comes to mind is an association with crafts, DIY crafts or DIY house projects, right? So um, if I told you that I was doing a DIY bathroom remodel, you probably know that I'm not a, a home contractor, so that would make sense. You think, oh, you know, she's 
she's being creative or crafty or whatever. Um, but, but a home contractor wouldn't say that they're doing a DIY home remodel, right? Because they're, they're a professional person who has the expertise to do that task. Um, and that would just sound sort of funny um, to us. So when we use the term DIY, uh, we often mean that, uh, it, you know, there's a lot of meaning imbued with it because it means that the task or the activity itself is not usually done yourself. So we have to use DIY to modify it um, to say that you are doing it yourself, right? So there's actually a lot of meaning in there. Um, so just to give another example, right? If I, you know, I do my own dishes, I do my own laundry, I don't DIY dishes, I don't DIY laundry. And so um, when we use it in reference to science and medicine, right, what we, the implication is that one without traditional expertise or training in science or medicine is really performing acts of science and medicine outside of a professional realm. So something is different than um, the quote, uh, normal or socially acceptable way uh, of doing things. Um, and I used normal in, you know, there's air quotes going on there. Um, that's because the norms, right, and what's socially acceptable and things like that obviously are fluid, change over time. Um, so just to give you some historical context, right, um, medicine was not always professionalized, um, right? It was only professionalized really in the late 1800s. Um, and prior to that, right, you could, you know, cure yourself or you could go to a physician. Either one was, you know, totally okay and, and, and the norm. Um, so here's just a, a picture of a book from 1736, every man, um, his own doctor. So that's just to say that, um, you know, the norms of what's, what's professionalized and what's not, right, change um, over time. And that's the case with science as well. Um, okay, so just to, so that was just, you know, kind of sidetracked for to get us thinking about what DIY is. Um, but uh, I wanted to just talk briefly about DIY, what DIY science is usually used in, re uh, the term is usually used in reference to and what DIY medicine is usually used in reference to. So DIY science, um, another way of uh, people have used the same term is DIY bio, DIY biology, um, biohacking. And this is really, people use this in reference to a movement that emerged about 15 years ago um, where people do science um, outside of um, laboratories, outside of institutions. Um, and they come together. A lot of them have uh, training in biology, not all of them, but some do have quite a high level of training in biology. Um, and they uh, often come together in community wet labs. So the tools of doing biology are not always very cheap. Um, and so this involves in, uh, a lot of in-person, uh, typically in-person um, interaction in these shared or common uh, spaces. And this movement, and so I say this in contrast to what I'm gonna talk about next, which is do-it-yourself medicine, there's often um, uh, political undertones here, or even I think probably overtones um, regarding who should do science and where they should do it. Um, so, you know, there's these values of open science, of transparency, um, of open access. And this really comes in reaction to science being, you know, in many ways walled off, right? Behind paywalls, behind these closed doors, really not accessible um, to the public. So there's very much this political feeling uh, related to DIY science that um, I really personally in my own research have not seen in, in do-it-yourself medicine to the same extent. So that's, you know, the one slide on, on DIY science. Uh, do-it-yourself medicine is a little bit different um, so, and I'm going to talk about that, <laughs> that, that YouTube photo there in a moment, um, but these are individuals um, who are frustrated by a lack of access to treatment. So I, I put individuals there, I also could have said patients, right? So these are people who are generally sick, who for some reason can't get access to treatment. And that's either because the treatment um, itself simply does not exist, there is no treatment. Um, there could be uh, an experimental treatment that has not yet been approved by the FDA. So people are hearing about the promise of treatment, maybe in the media, um, but they don't, they, they themselves can't access it. Um, or there might be a treatment that is approved and is out there, but they can't access it for some reason. Maybe they, uh, due to geographic uh, issues, maybe they live in a region where they can't access it. Maybe they don't have insurance. Maybe there's a stigma of going to their doctor and, and getting um, whatever the treatment is. So. Frustrated patients um, is, is one necessary ingredient for DIY medicine. Um, so they hear about these treatments. Um, these people usually share information online about experimental uh, treatments that are either in progress or that they hear about. Um, 
and they're typically motivated by a personal desire to improve themselves or their family. And this is really in contrast to DIY science where there's not as much of this patient, you know, there's, they're not typically patients, they're not usually trying to improve themselves or get better in some way. Um, so just to give a few examples, um, so this picture at the, at the right, um, so DIY, so fecal uh, microbiota fecal transplantations um, is, is a promising therapy to treat um, treatment resistant C. diff infections, which is a pretty, um, pretty bad intestinal um, disorder or infection. Um, and so that showed some very promising results about 10 years ago, a little more than that um, in the literature. And people were, you know, people at home were very frustrated. They were very sick. Um, you know, this treatment wasn't widely available. And so they began to transplant stool. Stool is relatively easily accessible. <laughs> it's a little gross, but um, they began to transplant stool um, like from their spouse into themselves or from their kid into themselves to try and self-treat infection. So that's, the, so I've studied the do-it-yourself FMT, fecal transplant movement. That's just one example of do-it-yourself medicine. Uh, other examples, uh, do-it-yourself brain stimulation where people heard about this brain uh, electrical stimulation, experimental treatment that they could do on themselves, um, began doing it to self-treat depression. I actually did my PhD on the do-it-yourself brain stimulation movement. Um, people have been hacking into insulin pumps and glucose monitors. Um, these are diabetes patients to create automated insulin delivery systems. Um, we also see a DIY movement with regard to um, the use of hormone replacement therapy of people who can't access it, who, who would like to access it. So, uh, so, you know, we've had these DIY medicine movements, DIY science is there, right? And then six months ago, seven months ago, <laughs> feels like 20 years ago, uh, COVID hits, right? Uh, and so uh, we see these movements play out um, in the context of COVID. And so with regard to DIY science, um, there was really kind of a burst of initiatives of people coming together and they started coming together um, in the virtual space, right? Because everything was shut down and um, uh, there was less of that community interaction, right? Um, and uh, so Lisa and I have a grant to study one of the, maybe the largest virtual space that, that DIY science folks communicate on um, called Jogal. Um, and Jogo launched an open COVID initiative. And so um, there are various projects on here where, where do-it-yourself folks were um, getting together to talk about masks, how to create better masks, how to hack ventilators, uh, create diagnostics. Um, there was a vaccine um, section uh, on this, but I, I'm gonna talk about the vaccine efforts that have actually garnered uh, more attention and have moved forward. But that's all to say that there was um, a big DIY science um, push um, to think about ways to, to think about things that could be used in, in COVID. Um, and so coming to what we're, um, you know, the topic of the day, right, um, is the DIY coronavirus vaccine. So this is an article from the Times from a few months ago. Um, and uh, this article describes several different DIY uh, coronavirus vaccine endeavors. And there are a number of them that have been going on. Most of them are pretty quiet. I would say, um, except for one called RADVAC, uh, which is the Rapid Deployment Vaccine Collaborative. And this is a collaborative that self-describes as a group of citizen scientists uh, motivated to action by the suffering caused by the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. Um, and basically what they did was they put out uh, a white paper um, uh, describing how to make a vaccine and um, uh, so this is like, I forget how many pages, uh, maybe 100 pages, 70 pages, something like that. It's a very long white paper, but with very explicit directions about how to make a vaccine and then how to assess uh, immunity. And so one of the most interesting features of RADVAC, right, so they're a collaborative, um, and, and part of the reason, or a large part of the reason, I should say, why they got so much attention um, was because it wasn't just lay individuals involved, it was people with, you know, pretty big name institutional affiliations. So George Church um, is a quite a well-known geneticist who's been part of this. And there's a few other folks with Harvard affiliations that were on this and putting this out and really making it very public. You could just go download this on the website. Um, so I just want to, uh, in my last slide here, just talk about a few points of consideration that I think will be uh, related to RADVAC that I think are really interesting and, and relevant for the coming discussion on research ethics. 
Um, so one is that these individuals promote the values of, of open science, right? So again, that's just pointing that out. That's hearkening back to, right, again, this DIY science. There's all these values that, that, that individuals are promoting here. So they see what they're doing as this, um, you know, very positive open science um, initiative. Um, again, I, I think part of the reason why it's a little different is that you have these researchers with some professional um, training with, uh, you, know, a large, you know, a large degree of professional training and current um, institutional uh, affiliations. Um, and so in terms of exactly what they're doing, right? So um, they're publishing information regarding vaccine and immunity assessment. So they don't claim to be running a trial um, but they are putting out very detailed information. And I think that's going to be key for our discussion later, right, is if you're not running a trial and you're just putting out <laughs> information and you're just saying, I'm just putting this out here, you know, um, you know, here's the recipe of how to do it, right? Um, you know, when, when, do, when do we think of something as research and, and when do we not? Um, so I should say that they are asking their friends, they're, they're sharing this information and requesting that their friends do it. They're not mass publicizing anything, but they are requesting that their friends do it, but they're not um, distributing materials as far as we know publicly. Um, I don't know if we'll get into a legal discussion, but the distribution of materials is really the key, one of the key factors that uh, will determine whether FDA's authority kicks in or not. Um, but they are not, again, as far as we know, distributing materials to other people. Um, finally, this is, you know, it's not really an N of one, right? We could talk about self-experimentation. It's more of like, but it's also not necessarily a subject population. You know, it's not a group. It's like a group of N of ones, right? So they're asking people to do these things on themselves at home. But they're, as far as I know, they're not systematically collecting the data um, in any way. Again, this is what is publicly known, which may not be the whole, the whole picture. Um, and finally, their goals are um, a little bit unclear. So are they doing research? Are they not, right? They kind of like put this out on their site. This is how you make the vaccine. This is how you assess immunity, nothing. There's no like email us if you know your results, what you did, there's nothing like that. Um, and so on their informal calls, they've said that they really hope that, you know, just by putting this out there, maybe they'll find a better, better way of delivery. So I should say it's an intranasal, it's an intranasal delivery mechanism um, using a peptide. So it's, they're not working with live virus and they're not working with um, attenuated virus. They are working with just proteins, um, peptides um, and trying to uh, instigate an, an immune response. Um, so again, their goals are unclear. And so um, as we um, you know, think about these issues, right? Um, I think the question of whether this is research or not, is this research, is this bad research, um, right? That will really inform our, our thinking or at least inform some of the ways we think about some of the, the questions. So that's it. Uh, and I will pass it off um, to Lisa. Hey everyone, let me share um, my screen now. There we go, how's that? All right, uh, so I'm Lisa Rasmussen. I'm a professor in the Department of Philosophy at UNC Charlotte. And uh, I've been studying research ethics and clinical ethics um, most of my career and I've moved much more into the research ethics realm. I've been teaching research ethics classes since I started this job. <clears throat> and in the course of doing that, I started to realize all the ways in which research falls outside of conventional categories of all kinds. Today we'll talk about ethical and regulatory categories, but that sort of brought me into the realm of citizen science and DIY bio, biohacking, community bio. They're not all the same thing and they don't even agree about where they disagree about where to use those names and those labels, but <clears throat> they, they represent uh, in general, the kind of thing that Anna was talking about in her definition of DIY bio, which is that people who are not necessarily trained in a particular area are working in that area. And or if they are extensively trained, they may not have a professional affiliation or employment. So I started to think about, well, what are, how are they processing ethics 
Um, what are they thinking about doing in their research? Um, and what should the rest of us think? And by us, I mean all of us who are interested in these kinds of topics, research ethicists, members of the public, regulators, lawyers, et cetera, right? Um, so I wanted to talk about trust architecture as a sort of conceptual approach to finding a way forward for thinking about ethics in these fields. So in general, um, we trust people because we have a relationship with them. We know what they're all about. We have a past exposure to them or something, right? But when we engage in some of these um, more complicated transactions with people, the less we can verify who they are, what they're all about, the more we need to have trust in something. So we put our money in banks, trusting they won't fail. We get on a plane, trusting it's not gonna collapse in flight. We trust in relationships, right? I don't mean to suggest that those are all the same. Um, but the point is that we trust when we can't know, when we can't verify deeply something that um, may have an implication for us. And so we have a couple of bases. In, in um, relationships, we trust because we've seen patterns of behavior. Maybe there's some hope, <laughs> idealism, na naivete thrown in. Um, and this kind of trust can be the basis of other trusts, like testimony trust. And so here I'm going to draw on the, um, the Schaefer and, and now it's in my way, um, the book Leviathan and the Air Pump. And so the example, um, one of the examples they talk about is that Boyle trusted Pascal, who in turn trusted his brother-in-law to say that, hey, I carried this barometer up um, the mountain and the mercury fell, meaning there's less air pressure once I go up there, right? And so that became the foundation of some scientific knowledge because we could trust that they were observing something correct because they couldn't, there was one instrument, not everybody could um, observe that experiment. And so that can convey scientific knowledge. So now I wanna talk about harms in particular because I think particularly when we're thinking about RADVAC and COVID, we're thinking about how could this go wrong, right? Um, maybe trusting somebody to bring a barometer up a, a mountain doesn't have as much effect on our lives. But when we think we have a risk of harm, we're either not going to do it and we're going to protect ourselves or we look for some kind of protection from harm. And if we can't verify the protections, like here's a doctor saying, I'm going to treat you well, trust me. Um, we maybe put our trust in the medical licensing boards who make sure by and large that physicians have accurate train, or adequate training, that they're overseen, uh, things like that. When we join research, we're trusting that there's a whole system in place that can help us rely on the general trustworthiness of participating in this research. And those are the trust architectures, the, the structures that do the trust work for us because we can't have a personal trusting relationship. So just a couple of examples. Um, we have laws that dissuade wrongdoers with criminal punishment, tort findings, et cetera. Um, we have regulations for banks and airplanes and cars and things like that. Um, and they also, by the way, that part of the way that trust architecture work is we know that there are um, examiners or um, people who run spot checks on airplanes, things like that, that the trust is in the people and the system who carry out the inspections that we wouldn't be able to do on our own. Um, in science, we trust, um, it has multiple trust architectures, including things like peer review, replication, retraction. I'm sure I don't need to rehearse for everyone <laughs> some of the recent limitations we've been seeing there. But in general, the system tends to lead us to be able to trust it. So one of the things um, that is really provocative about the blockchain and cryptocurrency is this new, what they call zero trust architecture. So the way that um, the blockchain works is by having ledgers on lots and lots of computers all over the world that are very difficult, but turns out not impossible to hack. And so we don't have to trust a bank or a government. We trust the um, dispersed nature of the blockchain, the ledger system, okay? So distributed ledger networks bring together communities that otherwise would not trust each other sufficiently. They are trust machines. There's another book I haven't put in here uh, called Who Can You Trust by Rachel Botsman, I think. Um, and her claim is a lot of the technology advances we've seen like Airbnb and Uber are not about 
anything other than the trust mechanism that Airbnb has a set of systems in place to make you go, okay, I'm going to go stay at somebody's house or I'm going to get in somebody's car and I'm going to trust that they take us to the right place. So what's the trust architecture and research ethics? And here's just a very brief history. Um, we know that after Tuskegee, the US government started to think about what they needed to put in place to ensure that research was conducted adequately uh, because personal and professional trust in physician researchers was <clears throat> lacking, right? That turned out to be the case. And it, it, there must be a, a really interesting study to do here about just how many of these examples it takes until somebody says, let's do something about this, right? Tuskegee wasn't the only one. It was just the biggest one and it was on the heels of a lot of other things. So then Congress took over with the National Research Act. They commissioned the National Commission for the Protection of Human Subjects, who wrote the Belmont Report, which codified some very basic ethical principles and recommended how those would be um, realized in the protections in research ethics. And so in 1981, the first human subject regulations were passed and we have the common rule in the revision, right? So we have this big system of IRB oversight. So thinking just of human subjects, right? We have prospective review and a lot of the work for that actually is done by the mere existence of the architecture because everybody knows they have to write their protocol in such a way that it would pass somebody else's muster. So ideally they're doing the work ahead of time to put it in that um, condition. Okay, so um, in research ethics, move this over, um, the trust architecture is regulations and oversight. They tie together reliability, dissuasion, verification, protection, and, and the different kinds of consequences that you can um, have if you fail to follow them, if you violate the norms. And there's also whoops, uh, an element of the scientific trust architecture at the same time, right? Because as we know, when we're talking about ethics and research, if it's not scientifically accurate and grounded, then it's unethical because no matter what you find, it will not have been worth whatever minimal resources you expend on it. And so some of what's going on here is also the scientific trust architecture that research is done by qualified individuals. We see that in the Nuremberg Code, for example, that you assess risk and benefit ratios, there's a threat of consequences, et cetera. So um, thinking about unregulated research, um, I think here is a set of challenges. So one challenge is just practical that when you look at all these fields, even if you just take biohacking, if you just take citizen science, there's not a single lever or umbrella or whatever metaphor you want to use that'll capture everything and make it be ethical, right? So it's going to have to be a dispersed system inherently. There's also conceptual challenges like what counts as a human subject in need of protection when that's not defined in a regulation. So a brief example in citizen science is um, a research study that was done collecting eggs from the invasive house sparrow from pe near people's houses. And so you'd get the eggs because it turns out if you just take the eggs, the sparrows lay more. But if you take the eggs and you put a dummy egg in, they stop laying eggs and you can decrease the population without horror, I guess. Um, and so they then they would send in the eggs to a lab to be studied. But the IRB said that's human subject research because the addresses of the people sending the eggs in were being collected, right? So there was some negotiation back and forth and eventually they agreed not to count that as human subject research. But the point is, this all has to be negotiated on an individual institution basis. Um, there are financial challenges like biohackers and citizen scientists often have little to no funding. Um, for their research, let alone for the architecture that ideally would help ensure these protections. Um, there are constitutional legal challenges like, so with what power could we go in and tell people they can't collaborate on interesting projects together, right? That infringes on speech and assembly rights. And then there's ideological challenges, which is um, a lot of these fields attract people who want to join them because they're extra institutional, they're not fitting in the conventional frame, they're, you know, people who move fast and break things, etc. And so they're not necessarily going to all fall in line, even if we could meet all these other challenges. So 
um, what can we do? I think there's a couple of, I'm just gonna go through these fairly quickly and I'm happy to share these slides um, afterwards. Um, one approach is radical transparency. You just post everything that you do all the time and you just let other people figure out whether there's something not to be trusted about that. Sorry. Um, and so the problem here is um, it's like too many tubes of toothpaste on the shelves when you go to the grocery store, right? Why is the burden of choosing and evaluating the ethics of this on the consumer of the research? Is that the best place to put it, um, especially when sometimes they're the participants as well? Um, there could be some kind of a voluntary subscription for accountability, which, for example, you could pay a little fee and say, I'm going to agree to hold hold myself um, liable if I violate these norms. And then the money pays for someone who's harmed or uh, to prosecute the case or something. Um, but again, this requires a central organizing body. It's hard given the financial and ideological commitments in citizen science and DIY bio. Uh, there's collective accountability um, where I sort of gave it these, this title, we all watch the watchers. Um, where we all kind of look, we just keep watching each other, we keep an eye on each other. And that kind of um, overcomes some of the problems above with the individual having to make an assessment, but then you have this balkanization of standards. There's all kinds of standards, people disagree about the standards and the burden is still on the participants or users of the research. So I, I can't say that I've solved this problem, unfortunately, um, but the one that I'm thinking about now is this sort of negotiated trust. and. I guess, you know, Anna and I will talk about the, the grant we've got, and maybe we're seeing a little bit of that going on there too, but I know um, we're thinking about it in citizen science, where the people who are working on a project, and that might be the researcher, the community members, the participants, the data donators, whatever we call them, together say, okay, how are we going to self-govern, and what standards are we going to agree to? Um, I think you still are going to need tools, um, and I'm on another grant in citizen science kind of working on supplying some of these tools to help people make their own choices about the ethics. Um, one of the things that people might not think about is building structures and procedures to try and equalize power standing. It's maybe a little less of an issue in biohacking, but I know in citizen science where sometimes you have big groups um, and community uh, institutional researchers working with community members, there's a real power differential that needs to be confronted and negotiated. Um, and then you still have, I think, the question of where does the locus of responsibility lie? If something goes wrong, in this kind of a case, if you've negotiated, does that mean we all share equally the burden of um, whatever happened or not? So that's... Um, a way of thinking about at least where we are with a, a trust architecture and maybe some paths forward. So I'll turn it back over to you. Get rid of my slides here. Sorry. Great. Thank you so much. Um, there's so many interesting questions. So um, just as a reminder for participants at home or in the office, there's the Q&A icon. Please start um, asking questions and um, we're going to make sure that we answer as many as we can. Um, so I'm gonna start with a few questions and hopefully we'll hear from the audience as well. So, um, so one thing that was sort of highlighted by both of your presentations is that there isn't necessarily consensus on what we call this thing. It's like not, they're not sharp sort of um, boundaries on what counts as, and so, I mean, I'm very interested in thinking about like, you know, what should we call this? So you've mentioned DIY bio, citizen science, um, biohacking or hacktivism. Um, is it human subjects research? Is it even research? I think that just like even having a conversation and in some ways, maybe it's sort of a large umbrella and there's different potentially conflicting um, identities and motivations going on. But I would love to hear a little bit more from both of you about how should we think about the main categories of the phenomena and the communities that are involved in um, these kinds of experiments. I can, I'll, I'll jump in first. Um, 
And I should say that this is, it's a very interesting question. And Lisa and I are part of um, a little do-it-yourself science working group. Um, and even on that group itself, <laughs> we just go back and forth with each other constantly about definitions. And um, we have a paper um, coming out also. And in that paper, the reviewers had some questions about definition. So it's something that we've definitely uh, thought about and, and sort of struggled with. So that's all to say there's no, there's no good answer um, for you. And, and also the, um, the distinction I put up between DIY medicine and science is not, a, you know, a bright distinction. I probably people in our little working group would, would disagree with that, that there is a distinction. Um, for me, I, I think the line between the self-improvement and the, you know, the line between what's treatment and what's research, I feel like was a bit more clear before COVID. And so part of the, you know, what, what has been challenging to think through um, with the RADVAC vaccine is that I know it's not treat, but treatment and, and let's call it prevention, right? Mm -hmm. um, part of what makes the COVID vaccine so interesting is that all of a sudden, this is a problem for everybody. We're all, everybody in the world now wants a vaccine. So everyone, you know, is interested in a preventative, right? Um, and so that sort of expands the category for me and challenges some of the definitions. Um, it also, right, challenges the definitions of who's, right, who's a lay individual, who's not, right, because in the opening definition of DIY, right, it's one with professional expertise um, doing some, or, or one without professional expertise doing something that's uh, normally done by a professional. Well, now you have George Church, who's like the professional, right, doing self-administering a vaccine. So, so it's all to say that it's, it's blurry and, and the RADVAC for me really, um, really adds, adds some more challenges. Um, and I'll, I'll think of a little bit more about citizen science um, since Anna talked about DIY. Obviously, one of the challenges in citizen science is who counts as a citizen. And so um, particularly when conversations around immigration and who has a right to be here and things like that arise, the word citizen and citizen science becomes even more problematic. Um, a colleague of mine asked once when I was giving a colloquium, is it citizen because of some relationship to the state? And I think that's a, an interesting question because we can think about, we, is it the state and professionalism, right? We know that the state gives licenses to professions to self-regulate and things like that. So if you're a citizen scientist, does that mean you're apart from the state mechanisms in some way or part of them, right? You're a citizen of the world, meaning you have intention to be a good citizen, to be collegial and collaborate with other people. Um, I think, well, I'll leave it there because I know there are more questions. Yeah, can I just ask one follow-up um, about how much of these communities arise in response to the inaccessibility and sort of power hierarchies that are sort of part of um, current scientific research? Like how much of this is because of the paywalls and the, you know, um, the under, like people seeing uh, lack of access to trial participation, for example, um, and the ways in which, you know, institutions and um, federal like regulatory boards and have sort of a say in, um, what research is prioritized. So there's all these sorts of ways that, you know, contemporary standard research has a lot of um, power structures that are in place that make it pretty inaccessible for lay people to participate or to participate in the studies that they're interested in. Do you think that this is in response to that? Or do you think that this kind of movement would be here regardless of the kinds of inaccessibility and power hierarchies that are present in contemporary science. I'm gonna let Anna hand, handle that one first. <laughs> I have every thought. Yeah, I mean, right, COVID sort of <laughs> challenges, right? So I could give like a pre-COVID answer, I would say yes, right? Um, <laughs> so pre-COVID, I think it's definitely, the answer is is yes. And and you see that, at least for me, and, and the reason why I say that is because you see that in the what people are saying and what they're doing, and even now with COVID, right? So, so what Lisa and I have this grant to do is it's an NSF grant um, to study the Slack channel 
where these individuals are um, DIY bio folks are communicating about um, COVID projects, right? And so a lot of what we're seeing, even from the early analysis, is explicit, you know, um, phrases like saying like in response, right, to the slowness, right? So pointing out the slowness, the bureaucratic um, process, the fact that they can't get access to certain journal articles, or this is behind a paywall. And we're seeing just, I mean, we've begun the analysis, but we're, it's just very clear and, and it's very apparent in what people are saying. So that would be my answer pre-COVID. <laughs> Post-COVID, you know, it's interesting, right? Because this is something that suddenly affects everybody around the world, just like instantly, right? Um, and so would we see would we see endeavors where people are getting together to try and start doing whatever they could do, you know, if they had some sort of expertise or knowledge? Probably, you know, and I think we're seeing that with, we had some conversation in our little working group, right, uh, about whether, you know, people making masks, before there were masks and there were shortages of masks, which again also feels like 20 years ago, is that DIY medicine? Is that DIY, you know, is that DIY or is that just people getting together and creating things where there's an absence of something and there's a need. Um, so, so I'm not sure, I think we probably would see something, but what we're seeing now, at least the sort of more organized projects, I think are definitely keeping the strain of DIY science and, and are in reaction to the political, uh, to the power structures. And my brief thought on that, Dana, was um, I think you could write a lot about what the various drivers are. I think that that is definitely a driver, but there are other drivers like, I don't know, there's all these PhDs who can't get jobs, right? <laughs> they wanna use their talents, right? Um, there are alternative funding mechanisms like crowdfunding, um, you know, um, Patreon and things like that. So the levers to do this stuff are kind of like now accessible. Maybe it's like a deconstructed research <laughs> Um, career, right? You don't have the job with the lab and, and everything you need right here, but you've got some funding over here, you've got your basement over here, etc. So I think there are a lot of drivers um, that would be really interesting to unpack. Can, can I add something in response to Lisa's talk? <laughs> um, so I just want to say, so, so something really interesting with regard to harm, right? So there is this sort of perception that a lot of people have of DOI bio is uh, being reckless and stupid, and they're not thinking at all about what the harms are. Uh, and what we've been seeing in our project, and I know our colleagues who've studied DIY bio have also seen, is that people are, okay, not everybody, right? Again, you can't make a statement that encompasses everybody, but um, they've, at least on the um, Slack channel that we've been studying, they have have set up this biosafety board amongst themselves. And so one of the things that I think has been most interesting coming from our initial data is the um, is the struggles and the conversations they've had to figure out what this biosafety board will do and how it will apply. Should it apply to everyone? Should it be mandatory? Should it not be? Um, but these are just individuals who do think about the harms and who do, not always, again, but um, I, I just wanted to, to point that out and, and make that apparent. Thank you. Um, so I want to ask a question about sort of what is distinctive about um, citizen science in medicine, and Anna, you've already sort of brought up some of the differences between DIY science and DIY medicine, um, and how they're interestingly sort of starting to coalesce when it comes to COVID-19. Um, so, I mean, what, when sometimes when people think about citizen science, they think about like bird watching or like, you know, crawl, you know, they think about a lot of like these sort of massive data-driven public measures, and they're like, oh, well, what's What's the matter with that, right? So, I mean, and as you say, Anna, DIY science and DIY medicine has a long history and it's pervasive in multiple fields. Um, I think it is noteworthy and I'll just like put it here that the Nuremberg Code itself includes a discussion of experiments, self-experimentation and its principles, right? When it states that no experimentation should be conducted where there is an a priori reason to believe that death or disabling injury will occur, except perhaps in those experiments where the experimental physicians also serve as subjects, right? So there's this sort of interesting awareness, even at the start of thinking about research ethics, that this might be some sort of qualifying way in which to understand exceptions of research or one research might be actually like, um, uh, okay. So, I mean, one question I guess I have is, 
you know, what is ethically distinctive about the sort of biomedicine um, self experiments um, uh, in comparison to other kinds of things. And also, I guess I will invite you to, to sort of think about the, you know, what, what, um, what parallels are there? So what are what is distinctive about biomedicine self-experimentation, but what parallels do you see with the sort of broader community of people that are engaged in citizen science? Do you wanna take that one first, Lisa? Um, what do I think? Um, I had a thought and I'm trying to bring it back because it just flew out of my mind. So Anna, you take it, sorry. You are mute still. Sorry. Um, yeah, and so we actually um, have a special, well, we're working on um, perhaps doing a special issue call for specifically related to biomedical citizen science for um, the citizen science um, journal. Um, but I think a lot of citizen science, um, and Lisa, you should, you spent a lot of time there, so you should correct me if I'm wrong, um, but there is some sort of overarching, and again, this statement does not apply to all citizen science projects, but there is some overarching structure to what people have been doing. So a lot of times when people use the term citizen science, there is somebody leading the experiment and it's often, um, there's an architecture, <laughs> I could say, to the um, experiment or design, right? And it's often the citizen scientists themselves who are doing the gathering of the data, not the scientists. Um, so collecting, I don't know, taking images or um, there's one, uh, I think, software game called Fold It with folding proteins. So, so they're doing actions or they're, collect they're collecting data essentially uh, for the scientists. So it's not the scientists themselves that are collecting data, but the study itself, right, still often, again, probably not always, um, has the design. It is led by researchers, um, usually at institutions, right? Um, and so when so you could think about the things that start to fall apart in other aspects of um, citizen science or do-it-yourself medicine, right? So um, what if it's not led by anybody in an institution or what if the design is open sourced, right? And so um, what if, you know, uh, right? There's, there's different aspects to a research project, right? So, uh, right, you have the recruitment. So what if the recruitment's not done by the scientists but it's done by the citizens themselves and that's kind of dispersed and not overseen. And so, you can think about the various levels. So I see it on a spectrum, right? Again, there's no hard and fast um, lines here, right? Um, but I think in the movements that I study and at least with the um, now in COVID, right? It becomes more and more dispersed. There's no one really leading it anything. <laughs> um, and, and you see this in their conversations. They're like even afraid to make an edit on a page because they're afraid that their edit you know, on, on, a, on a shared document because they don't want to be the only one to make the edit on the page they want it to be shared. So I think what it does, so I think a lot of the biomedical citizen science really breaks down um, um, the oversight and, and the uh, who's leading it, who's leading the project uh, more than others, which then complicates how we think about, um, I think, some of the ethical issues when it's not overseen by one entity. I think too, in citizen science, it's, uh, and I was, I, I was toggling too much back and forth between all of these categories, trying to figure out how I wanted to answer the question. In citizen science, I don't think most, I don't think anybody really would say they're self-experimenting. Um, but that's from the side of citizen science that I've seen, which is this more contributory community, ecology, um, habitat driven side, right? But I think there may be people doing DIY or self-experimentation or me DIY medical or, or something who would also use the term citizen science. And so then that leads you into thinking, well, what are these terms doing for us? You know, why do we want these categories? And like all categories, they're sort of helpful so that we can slot things in the right place in our brain. And that's why this is such a kind of crash mentally for us because these categories just cross cut depending on which element of them you focus on, right? Um, but I think when I think too about biohacking, it is sort of self-experimentation, but that motive there isn't necessarily experimentation driven for 
some generalizable knowledge in some cases it is right but some people are like i just want to do this cool thing to my body or i feel better if my body is this way whether they ever share it with anyone whether anyone else ever does it doesn't matter so this is almost a, a more aesthetic or phenomenological point than a scientific mm -hmm. work right and just quickly again like norms change right so self-experimentation was a perfectly valid way of producing knowledge hundred years ago <laughs> and it was the way it was done and now it's not the norm so things have changed pretty quickly so i have one question from the audience that um so from pam, pam salisbury that is related to the first question um uh which is just is is some of this uh, is some of the movement um driven by subgroups that mistrust the current system to treat their specific subgroup um fairly I think Anna, I'll, uh, um, I would recommend uh, <laughs> say more about the um, hormone replacement because that seems like a group. I'll, from the citizen science side, I think um, yes, definitely. So, for example, there are a lot of community citizen science projects where people will put an air monitor on their backs and walk around their community to show what the pollution levels are or um, they'll do um, something called bucket brigade air sampling where they sample differently than the EPA might and they can demonstrate. Um, so just to back up for a second, um, and I'm not gonna get this all technically right, but the EPA will sample sort of once in a while and then the mark that a, com that a corporation or a site has to meet is within 48 hours, the average didn't exceed X, right? But what you can do with the bucket brigade and a bunch of volunteers is you go out there and you sample much more frequently and you can show that there was a spike 10 times that average. But when you add in all the time, then it looks like it's not toxic, but it was very toxic for a short period of time. And so that's really a health issue, right? So um, one of the groups I worked with here in North Carolina um, the West End Revitalization Association, their tagline is science for compliance. And they're specifically saying, we're going to collect the data because you all aren't treating us well. And we're going to have to force you to comply with your own rules, which you're not doing. Um, so first, that's a really fantastic question. Um, so I think the only example um, that I can think of amongst DIY medicine is the hormone replacement therapy for, for a group not being able to access a treatment um, specifically due to stigma. But from what I've seen, and I, I personally have not studied um, the movement, but I've read works by others. Um, and it's whether you even call it a movement is, is a question, right? It's kind of like some other DIY medical movements are, I think, movements. This is more like a loose collection of people, but but yeah, I mean, there it, it's the stigma um, of going to the physician and requesting it um, that that's really driving a lot of this. There doesn't seem to be an overt, at least again in what I've seen, and I have not studied it specifically. There doesn't seem to be this overt notion we're not being treated right, so therefore we're going to do it like this. It's more just born out of the way that unfortunately um, things are um, for for these individuals. So there's. Yeah, I, I would say it's not overt, but it's certainly born born out of born out of being treated differently, for sure. So I have um, a response from um, Andrea White, who is um, a, a participant. So Andrea says, "I'd like to reply to the question about individuals treating themselves because they don't trust um, the doctor uh, or the trust architecture. When individuals experience a health issue that conventional medicine cannot." or has failed to address, um, they are then pushed to self-treat. Experiences of adverse effects of medication is one example. Another example might be the treatment of not yet recognized medical problems. Um, so it's a sort of nice addition to some of these issues. Yeah, I'll just say something about that. What we're seeing in, um, right, in terms of not yet recognized medical issues, um, chronic fatigue, um, right, is, is a huge one. Um, and it's it's super interesting because we're seeing um, similar symptoms appear in the long haul COVID folks, right? So these are people, a subset of people who have COVID, right? 
don't seem to be improving and seem to be, you know, having these really weird symptoms um, for a very long time. Um, so again, there's no treatment for them. There, I think there's actually been some recognition, at least there's some research going on, at least in Penn, they've actually set up a clinic to study persistent symptoms in COVID, which I think is, is a huge um, thing. But what we're seeing again is, is actually some kind of DIY movement come up. So now people who have these turn to online forums. So there's Facebook and Slack, and that's been actually a main method of communication people sharing symptoms, sharing what to do. And it's been really interesting. And there's also some um, researchers who are part of these groups who unfortunately also have long COVID or, or whatever um, you want to call it, um, who've actually been doing studies on themselves and on the group to try and do surveys to measure, um, to, to, yeah, to get a handle on what's going on. Um, so yes, that's a really important point. And just to follow up on that, there's a, if you're not familiar with it, there's a platform called Patients Like Me. Um, who, which was begun specifically to gather patients, both for profit of the people that own the platform and also for advancement. So it's this very interesting, it's, it's a not just for profit company is one of the taglines. Um, and so the great piece about this is that it is, it, it can enable movements, right? If you get a bunch of people who have these unrecognized symptoms or medical problems, like Andrea was talking about, you can find other people and together you have a bigger voice and you can push for more things um, than you could alone, but also you can maybe just study yourselves, which doesn't, it again, another slightly different wrinkle, you can self-study, which isn't the same as self-experiment. Mm -hmm. So there has been, um, I'm, this is the sort of final question that I'm going to ask um, given our time, but um, so first, thank you so much, Lisa and Anna for a really, um, exciting and tantalizing, tantalizing uh, conversation. So, I mean, a lot of the discussions that we've been having the past few years related to research ethics has been about um, community engaged research and trying to sort of um, make it so that communities have some sort of authority or say in prioritizing what research questions are really asked. How do you see DIY um, medicine, DIY science, citizen science as in relation to this sort of movement of community engagement? I um, have had some experience with that just recently. I think the in citizen science, there's absolutely an element of community engaged science. And in fact, um, in the Citizen Science Association, there's a working group called the Environmental Justice Practitioner Working Group. And this is a bunch of people who have been doing this work for a long time. Um, when it wasn't called citizen science. And they have been frustrated by researchers coming in. Here's a term I've just learned recently, academic extraction, right? coming in and getting the data and then leaving and not solving the problem. And what they want is solving the problem. So there's some interesting on the researcher side, there's this interesting negotiation of how do I maintain my neutrality and my goal to benefit science and not just to benefit the community. Um, yeah, very, very briefly, I will say um, that makes me think a lot about expertise and who has expertise and who should we be turning to, um, you know, to gain expertise, right? So um, is, you know, a patient is in many ways an expert um, in their own, well, is an expert in their own condition. Um, and so I think that there's recognition of that. I actually um, have some other work looking at online pregnancy forums and how people are uh, turning to each other on pregnancy forums looking for information about their condition just as much as they're probably going to the doctor um, and getting uh, information um, from them. Um, so I, I think it raises interesting questions about, yeah, who's the expert and, and where can we get expertise and how does someone suffering from a particular disorder um, gain knowledge? Well, thank you uh, both. And thank you everyone for joining in. Um, I hope you have a good rest of the week. <laughs>